Okay, now I'm going to insulate the walls. Okay, the inspector came out and looked at the insulation and he is happy with what he sees. So we have to go ahead to patch everything up. I started sticking insulation back in where I had to remove it to run wiring. Uh, got the insulation all done here. Uh, when he heard this was going to be a bedroom, he asked for an egress window. So we have a bigger window now. I uh, just dropped the sill down lower. Um, we got the rock wool in here because it's new construction. They want R15, which rock wool delivers. So made the changes he asked for, and uh, he's happy, and I'm happy, and uh, we're going to start sheet rocking. Um, I put this ant and roach powder. Different people make it. Uh, boric acid is what you're looking for here. <clears throat> Not a sponsor. Uh, I like to put it on the sill before I close the wall up. So if any bugs should infiltrate, they will immediately walk through poison, which will stick to their legs and wipe out them and their colonies. So I will bring death to you and your entire family if you uh, trespass on construction I built <laughs> and you're a bug. So just a little tip there. Uh, throw a little bit of bug powder down before you start building. I also uh, pushed in on the sheet, uh, the um, insulation and dropped a little bit down into the pockets here as well, where I had removed the sheetrock to run wiring. Uh, I had a couple sheets of green sheetrock. This is the mildew resistant kind left over from the bathroom. You do not need to use it in regular living space, just spots where they have high moisture or high humidity. However, I got two sheets left. I'm not bringing this back to the store to exchange it for white sheetrock. I'm just gonna use it. It won't hurt anything. It's okay to use mildew resistant where you don't need it. It's not okay to use regular white sheetrock where you do need mildew resistance, in my opinion. So uh, I cut a weird shape here, and it's all going to make sense to you in a minute or two when I show you where this piece is going. So you can see now, I just let it run the full 48 inches over the window. I cut it to fit the window frame, and then I cut it back a little bit from the window frame so that this other piece this is gonna to have to be a separate piece of sheetrock it'll have something to be nailed to and that's why it's cut like it is now I'm going to take the wonder bar you slip the wonder bar under the sheetrock and when you step on it it's like a little fulcrum foot operate it and it'll lift the sheet up against the ceiling nice and tight while you nail it or screw it I'm going to nail it just to hold it in place but then the rest of it will be screwed because I don't like nails. You can't get nail pops if you don't use nails. No such thing as screw pops. All right, just in case you guys want to see how I cut this. Uh, let's 
start out with your shorter side. I'm holding this close so it doesn't crack on me. Now for the long one, you can use a straight edge, but I trust myself to freehand this. Oops. That's what I get for being cocky. Okay. Normally I can reach over, but I'm going to have to get behind this one because this is a deep cut. That's what spackles for. Now I got this little short piece to cut out for under the window, just like on the other side, but mirror image. I'll make a shortcut. Use the razor for the longer cut. Just a little tip, this piece was wide enough, but if you're trying to do a little short piece, cut it on one side, cut it on the other side. You can use your thumb as a spacer. I don't know if you saw that. Cut it on one side, cut it on the other side, use your thumb as a spacer. And if you crack it back and forth, it'll, a small piece will crack right off and be, you'll be done with it. <clears throat> The heat has been installed, the radiant floor heating, so it is now warm enough to spackle. I'm going to get spackling. Alrighty class, welcome to Spackling 101. Uh, I was just going to spackle the room and maybe do like a um, time lapse, but uh, I was told it might be better to do a how-to video, so that's what I'm going to do. So first thing you want to do is get yourself about a six inch knife and a tray. And for nails or screws, where you attach it to the stud, you wanna do something along the lines of this. Okay, make sure you scrape off the excess. You would do the whole line, and then you come back and just do this. Done. Now take that. Just to show you again, A little bit of joint compound, mud, spackle, whatever you're using on your knife. It's that simple for the nail holes. Okay, so when you have to tape a seam, that's what we've got going on here. There's a few different ways. One thing you can do is kind of just tilt the knife, drag it 
get your mud in there. I'm using joint compound. Some people use spackle. But spackle is very hard and it takes a long time to dry and it's hard to sand. It's kind of like paint. The rule for paint is uh, get the paint where it ain't. Thin it out. And you take your tape. I know they have the self sticking and the, uh, the mesh, but I still swear by good old fashioned paper. And there's no rules. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Some people wet the tape so it'll stick better. Sorry, technical difficulties. Uh, so once I got my tape embedded, you might want to just push the top in. I got a little bit of left tilt to it, come down the left side, a little bit of a right tilt to it, come down the right side. This one. right tilt, right side, left tilt, left side. And I'm gonna let that dry. And when it dries, I'll probably come back with a wider knife and I'll do the whole thing. Um, any chance you get to kill two birds at one stone, take it. You know, make things easy on yourself, cut down on the workload. Um, this cracked on me when I was cutting it and then trying to lift it and install it. It's what I get for trying to do it single-handedly without help. So I'm just going to get some spackle down the crack. That was a running gag when I did construction. You see the plumber with his butt hanging out. You'd say spackle that crack. If you could uh, beat him up or uh, outrun him, you could just fling a blob of it at his crack and fill it in for him. I wouldn't recommend doing it if he's bigger than you and faster than you. <laughs> I know I got a heavy hand, I put way too much on. But as long as you can keep it from hitting the ground, I think in my book you're doing okay. All right, now I got some tape up there. center it up. I'm lucky that I could center this. If I couldn't, I would have had to rip it and do another piece that follows the crack if the crack made a weird turn. Embed that. A little right twist, get the right side. A little bit of a left twist, get the left side. And we'll let that dry so we'll they put. All right. Down here is the same thing. If you want to, you can take your tape, measure it out, and peel it off before you start. But uh, down low, same thing as up high. Get your mud on there. I like to push the knife hard and then lighten my grip so that it's feathered thin out at the edge, thick in the middle. Then come from the other way and do the same thing. Just kind of knock it down, lessen how extreme it is. Keep the knife clean. If you let the spackle dry on your knife and then scrape it in there, you're going to have bits of hard spackle in there and it's going to wreak havoc on your spackle job. Okay, Let's get this tape on there. You can let it run a little bit wild. If it's too long, 
it's not a big deal. Just try not to let it run where there's no spackle behind it. You come back later, or in this case right now, because there's no spackle behind it, pin it against the wall with your knife and peel it right off. Now on this one, I can pin it down low and bring my knife up. Down here under the receptacle was cut a little bit sloppy, so I put a dab of spackle under there. You gotta be careful not to let your knife hit any wires and short out. And this crack, it was a little bit too big for me to spackle and tape it right now, but it's a little too small for me to cut a piece of filler to put in there. So I'm just gonna spackle this, let it dry. This is going to crack, and that's fine, because if I try to put tape over it now, what's going to happen is gravity is going to make the wet spackle belly out. And then the tape's going to be sticking out. And you can't sand off the tape or it defeats the purpose of putting the tape on there. So if this dries and bellies out, no big deal. I can sand it flat. And then I will put a thin coat of spackle on it and put the tape on it and it'll be done properly. I guess next we will tackle a corner. So this was a garage, they didn't do the best workmanship out here, and I had to tear the walls apart and put wiring in and change things around, plumbing and whatnot. So um, we've got a lot of missing chunks here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, which has bits and pieces of sheetrock and mess in it from doing other scenes like this one, and I'm going to take this and I'm going to dab it into these holes. gonna move it out sometimes you gotta get the spackle onto the tip of your knife close to the edge so you can get it where it's got to go and I can tilt this so that I'm funneling it towards the green wall and just get it in the holes If you have any mess, any particles you picked up, here's a chance to get rid of them and actually have them do something useful instead of just making your life miserable. And I am not going to tape this corner right now. I'm just going to fill in those holes, let that dry, and then I'll come back and tape and spackle the corner. Here is an inside corner. I'm going to show you how to do that. What I like to do, get a lot of spackle on my knife. Since it's on the bottom edge, clean that up a little bit. I'm going to tilt my knife like so and get that up this corner. And I'm changing the pitch of my knife to keep introducing fresh joint compounds to the wall. And then much like when you did the seam, just kind of knock down that excess. Okay. Now I'm going to come from the top, going on the opposite wall. I've got the top of the knife against the wall, the bottom of the knife loose because I'm heading in a downward position. Now I'm going to have the bottom of the knife against the wall and the top placed loosely because I'm coming up the other side. All right, now get my spackle out on the end of the knife, change my grip, or change hands if that works for you. Top of the wall, I got the top of the knife tilted against the white wall. I'm coming down, leaving a trail of spackle behind. All right. 
get rid of some of that excess light touch. If you push hard, you're just gonna take the spackle right back off again, and that defeats the whole purpose of what you're doing here. Light touch. Very, very light touch. You're gonna get a feel for it the more you do it. And you're gonna see when you go to put the tape in and press the tape in, you're gonna have spackle squirting out all over the place. That means you left too much. Or you're gonna do it and nothing's gonna squirt out, and later on your paper's gonna peel off, and then you had too little. Let me just get the bottom down here real quick. I don't think you can see me. You're not missing much. Okay, now I'm going to get my tape. on your tape, you're going to fold your tape right in half on that line. And then you're going to take it, fold it, and embed it. I'm a little light on spackle up at the top, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the end of this, I'm just going to dip it in the spackle so I pick up some. And now I'll fold it Stick it in the top corner there. All right, let me get my knife. Clean it off. And like I said, you can wet the tape, you can wet your knife. There's a lot of different methods to make this so your knife doesn't stick to the paper and the paper doesn't stick to your knife. Um, but I find the paper gets very flimsy and wrinkly when I wet it, so I don't like to do that. But there's some situations where I have no choice. It just works better when I wet it. Embed the tape into the, the joint compound. wanting to call it spackle. You know what I mean. All right, now, I can mess with this a little bit to try to get the wrinkles out. Get rid of some of this extra spackle. But honestly, if it won't cooperate, sometimes you just gotta leave well enough alone and cut your losses and stop. Otherwise you'll have an irreversible mess. It's better. Now see, I got ripples in it right here, so I'm gonna just go the opposite way of the ripples and kind of work them out. some of this excess spackle. All right, now I'm gonna leave it. It's better to let it dry and come back to it than to keep messing with it. You try to make it perfect and you just make it worse. Get these screw holes while I'm here. probably going to have to become ambidextrous too because when you get into a closet or a tight spot you're going to have no choice but to use the hand that you're not used to using. All right and that's your inside corner. Now let's do an outside corner. So on an outside corner you will have what is called corner beam. That's this metal strip that toughens this up. Otherwise, when someone touched it or leaned against it, it would keep crumbling the sheetrock. And all you really want to do with this is get some spackle about the width, a little less than the width of your knife, and attack it like so. And again, 
more than one way to skin a cat. Guys who do this for a living are probably, I'm probably making their stomachs turn. With how slow and sloppy I am. But I get good results. When I'm done, you can't tell it. I ever was here to do the repair. I will not stop until it's perfect. So you want to let your knife rest just over the edge of the metal. A little bit of pressure. And knock it off. Um, I got some bubbles here. I could just let that dry and give it another coat or I can hit it now. But again, I'm not getting good results, so sometimes you just got to cut your losses. Come back and do it later. Get it with the second coat. You can see where it kind of gravity is making it purse out of the holes. You know, it's just nature of the beast. You may not get it perfect for your first try. There's other tricks you can do too. You can use uh, the stuff with the blue lid, which is a little bit softer. You can use the stuff with the green lid, which is a little firmer. Um, you can buy stuff that you have to mix yourself. And you can mix it to whatever consistency you want. Uh, me personally, I like the stuff with the blue lid. My dad, he liked the stuff with the green lid. We drove each other nuts when we worked together. Because if he bought the spackle, he got what he wanted. If I bought the spackle, I got what I wanted. Same thing on this side. We have the knife just barely over the edge of the corner beam. The side you can't see is coming out much better <laughs> than the side that you can see. I guess that's also nature of the beast. I should have showed you how to install it. You know, for a guy with a YouTube channel, I'm pretty forgetful when it comes to recording stuff for my YouTube channel. But there's your outside corner. Uh, as far as the corner bead goes, there's a bunch of holes in it for spackle to adhere to, and there's some other secondary sets of holes for nails or screws. You want to put a nail or a screw in every other, other uh, nail or screw hole. I'll show you what I'm talking about in a later video. Here there's uh, some marks left by the edge of the knife. I'm just going to take this blade and drag it over that a couple times. And that knocks most of it off, and then the sanding will be lessened. And uh, when it comes to sanding, I love these uh, mesh sanding blocks. Uh, the sanding block will take any kind of paper you put in it, but I put the mesh in it. And uh, it, they last a long time. This one's for the ceiling, in the high up on the walls. This one's for up close and personal. And... Uh, it just does like a really nice job. It cuts fast. And it doesn't clog like sandpaper does. If it does start to clog, you just kind of... And it cleans.
cleans it out. The only thing that kills it is wet spackle. If you accidentally stick it in the wet spackle, it'll get in there and clog it up. But yeah, I mean, it just lasts and lasts and lasts. It cuts really fast without marring up the wall. Uh, you do have to be careful that you don't go crazy. If you're trying to go like this and you flip it, you could maybe gouge the wall up and you have to really learn and get the knack for this thing because it flips around on the end of the stick. And you can definitely flip it up and gouge the sheetrock up and now you have more spackling to do. But I mean, what are you going to do? You got to practice. You have to learn. You have to get the knack. And then uh, you'll be able to sand much faster. So if you're not familiar with spackling, basically um, you, you try not to spackle something that's sticking out. You want to spackle something that's indented. So if you have a bump or a lump or a nail or a screw, it's wiser to knock it in with a hammer until it's a dent and then spackle the dent. If something's already there that's bulging out and it's been painted over it, you can't sand it, you can't fix it, you can take a wide spackle knife and you can feather it from being a quarter inch thick here to tapering down to nothing above it and below it. But if you put a straight edge on that, it's going to be like a seesaw, which is a sure sign of poor spackling. But sometimes you can only do what you can do. Um, so for sanding, anything that's sticking out, like this right here, I'm just going to go over that. I want it to disappear from my eyes because if I can see it, I'll probably see it through the paint. And I want it to disappear from my fingers. I can feel a little bit of a lip here. Up here feels smooth, down here feels smooth. So now I'll go this way a little bit and see if I can get rid of that. Take it easy because you can sand off all the spackle you put on and then you have to reapply it. And if you're just putting it on and sanding it off, well, you're wasting time, obviously. We're not going to be worried too much about the edge of the door frame up here. I don't know if you can see the screw holes that are going on. I didn't spackle them because there's going to be a door with molding on it there. And the molding's going to cover that. So there's no sense in wasting time and energy spackling what no one will ever see. Um, anything that is kind of caved in, let's see if you can see this down here. So anything that's kind of caved in, I will go over it just because I'm, I'm feeling the vibration through here. If I feel it bumping in and out, I know that it's sticking out. But if I don't feel it and it's not disappearing, make sure there's no high spots, leave it. Circle it with a pencil, come back later and patch it with some more spackle. Uh, same thing if you prime the room and you see something that shows up after priming that you didn't see before, that's fine. Patch it, go over it with a little dab of primer, and then when it looks good, you're ready to paint. So this is a low spot here and down here. I'll just get back to them later. I'll circle them so I know right where they are and I don't forget about them. It's also smart after you think you got everything perfect to take a floodlight or some kind of a spotlight, shine that around the room. And, you know, looking up at these lights, the lights blind you. You don't see very well. Turn them off and shine a floodlight around the room. You'll find more imperfections that you may have missed. Uh, this used to be a garage. The walls are a catastrophe. I had to chop them all up to run wires. It's all Frankenstein's back together. I probably did about 100 patches in this room. So I'm gonna do my best to spackle it and sand it perfect, but I know that I can't get it all perfect. I would have to redo the entire room with a skim coat. So what I'm gonna do is when we're done, I'm gonna go with an eggshell or a flat finish that doesn't reflect light so that a lot of the imperfections won't show. 
and I'll probably use a matte roller to put the paint on. So the paint has a bit of a lumpy texture to it, which will hide some of the uh, imperfections. Because this was a garage, guys. I mean, come on. They did one sloppy coat 30-some years ago when this place was built. And that was it. So, doing the best I can, but you'd really have to do every inch of the room to make sure you didn't forget or leave anything out. So, spackling is pretty much done. Um... We took to some priming and a little touch up on the spackle. I circled the spots that needed touching up so that they wouldn't paint it. Uh, but room is shaping up real nice. And uh, this will dry, get a light sanding and the whole room can be primed and paint it. Then I think we're gonna pull up the plastic, vacuum real good, get the padding and the carpet down. And then I will do the door jams and the doors. And uh, this room will be done. You know, ceiling fan can go in. Wall plates can go on. Everything can get finishing touches. Uh, trim out the windows. We're getting there.